Hello, Dustin. Thank you for being here at Conversations at the Perimeter. Oh, my pleasure. We, uh, we've been looking forward to talking to you for a number of reasons. There's much that we want to explore with you, including a number of acronyms of projects that you're working on that have to do with deep space and distant explosions and everything else. But before we get to that, um, you're a, you're a computer, no, computational, computational scientist. scientist. So first I want to get into what that means, but I want to do so by saying that a couple of years ago, uh, I interviewed you for a story and, and you joked that when the job posting for a computational scientist came online at Perimeter Institute, that your friends basically said, this job was written for you, Dustin. You, you have to get this job because it blended uh, big data analysis and astrophysics. So can you tell us what, what do you do as a computational scientist? Uh, sure. So I have a kind of unusual job here. Um, I'm half in the IT department, um, helping other researchers make use of computing, um, and half a researcher myself. Um, so I work on astronomical surveys. Um, surveys that go out and measure big chunks of sky, um, often without preconceived notions of what we're going to find uh, in order to kind of make new discoveries. And when you talk about big chunks of sky, like how big are we talking here? <laughs> um, so in the one project, we are looking at basically all of the sky we can see from the northern hemisphere, except for the parts that are filled with the, with the Milky Way galaxy. Um, we care about things that are beyond the Milky Way for this particular project. So the Milky Way gets in the way. There are too many stars in our own galaxy to see the stuff behind it. <laughs> We're getting in our own way in our own galaxy. <laughs> Pretty much. And then you can't see the southern part of the sky because there's too much dirt in the way. <laughs> okay. So you're looking basically everywhere you can look? everywhere. Pretty much. And, and why is a computational scientist <clears throat> essential to doing this, this work? Um, so my degree was in computer science. Um, I kind of picked up physics on the job. <laughs> um, a lot of physicists are in the opposite position where they know the physics and they're suddenly faced with ever-growing data sets and there's just a real challenge to process some of them. Um, so having people with expertise in both is kind of key to making some of the advancements that we um, want to do in this kind of to push the next generation of understanding of the universe. Would you say that astronomy and cosmology is an area in particular where researchers with expertise in how to do these computations is really necessary? Lots of areas of physics are pushing boundaries, um, computational boundaries. Uh, so I know that um, our data rates, for example, aren't anywhere near what you would encounter at CERN, at the Large Hadron Collider. Um, but <laughs> we're probably in the ballpark. I know that. Um, at the, we use a Department of Energy supercomputer for one of my jobs, and my group is, uses basically the second or third largest user of the whole center, which has like thousands of users. So we're, we're kind of up there, I guess, in terms of data rates. Mm -hmm. Is there so much data because the universe is so enormous and you're looking at so much of it? Pretty much. Like when we see images from, from telescopes, we see billions of stars and billions of galaxies. It, it's essentially, all, all of that stuff out there in the universe is data that needs to be crunched. Yep, exactly. Basically, the sky is big <laughs> uh, at the scales that you can see from the ground. And that kind of sets the basic scale of the prob problem. So with the largest camera we have right now, it still takes thousands of images to cover the entire sky. And we want not just one image, but multiple images to understand not only what's going on at any instant, but trying to understand some of the changes time. So some of the work that you've uh, done has been with DESI. That's one of the acronyms that uh, we'll be bringing up today. I like that one because it's also it's a nice name, but uh, it, it stands for more than just a nice name. Can you tell us what DESI is and what it's for? Sure. So DESI stands for the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so this is uh, an instrument. It's a device that is um, sitting at the top of a telescope in Arizona. Um, it's, uh, instruments on these telescopes can be either cameras or spectrographs for the most part. Um, cameras, most people are pretty familiar with. Mm -hmm. um, spectrographs are a little bit different. This one is called a multi-object spectrograph. So basically we can take, we can observe 
um, many galaxies at once and break their light into spectra or rainbows um, and take precise measurements of like the brightness at each point of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. um, so the innovation with DESI is that it is it can take many more at once than previous generations of instruments. Um, it can observe 5,000 stars or galaxies every exposure. Wow. So um, it's really cool. It uh, and that's part one, of the one camera taking. Well, sorry, it's not a camera; it's a spectrograph. <laughs> right. One instrument taking five thousand observations all at the same time. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So, this is the real innovation of this instrument. And so, to give you a kind of a context, the previous generation could take uh, a thousand at once. That was the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and uh, that project is also cool. But basically. Um, in these projects, you have to choose ahead of time which objects you're going to observe, you know, and uh, because what, how they work is you stick a fiber optic cable um, and point it directly at each object that you want to observe. The light comes from your galaxy down the fiber optic cable to a spectrograph wow. that actually splits it into the rainbow. Mm -hmm. So then the challenge is, you know, how do you point a thousand little fiber optics at once? How do you point one at once, let alone a thousand or five well, so, thousand? And, they, and, and the other <laughs> challenge is you have to, like the fibers are like this kind of the size of a human hair, mm -hmm. uh, and you have to point them to finer than that precision. At galaxies that are the light. Yeah, exactly. gajillions of, right. <laughs> gajillions of And miles. your telescope weighs many tons. So the thing, like, it's really, the engineering is really amazing. So um, how do you do it? It's not a person with tweezers, right? <laughs> it's right. well, <laughs> <laughs> or is it? In the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, what they did was said they chose which galaxies they want to observe ahead of time. Um, they compute where they'll appear on the sky. Uh, oh, you have to choose uh, a set of nights that you're going to observe it on and a time within that night. Hmm. Uh, and given that, you can predict where they're going to be. Um, they take an aluminum plate drill little precision holes in the plate, thousand holes for a thousand galaxies, wow. um, ship those plates to the mountain, and then a crew of people by hand plug in fiber optic cables into each of those holes. <laughs> wow, and then, that's not how I imagined this would Yeah, exactly. Happen. It doesn't sound very high tech. You're right. Um, so during the night, they would go out and plug one of these cartridges into the one of these plates into the telescope. Uh, and that plate steers the light, you know, the fibers are just in just the right place to steer the light down those fibers to be collected in the spectrographs and make those measurements of a thousand galaxies at once. Let me uh, say just for a second, because I was talking about the hand plugged um, fibers in SDSS. Um, one of the, when DESI was being designed or proposed, um, one of the challenges was that you, scaling up from a thousand to five thousand um doing that by hand would just would just started to get like to be infeasible so um the way the desi instrument operates is really cool um it uses these little um robots and so five thousand of them and each of them um, has two little motors that allow it to rotate the fiber to any place within its little region. So it's sort of like your shoulder and elbow joints. Like there's um, one of the motors moves the shoulder or mm -hmm. like rotates the shoulder in a circle and the other can rotate the elbow in a circle. Um, so between that, they can position the fiber anywhere within their reach. Um, and then they're placed close enough together that they can just reach their, or like they have a little bit of overlap with their neighbor. So no matter where a star or galaxy lands on the focal plane of the instrument, at least one of them can reach it with its fiber. Right. Um, and it holds out its fiber and the light pours down <laughs> uh, and goes um, into our spectrographs. So another innovation of DESI was that in, in the previous generation, the spectrographs were, were bolted to the side of the telescope and they flopped around during the night uh, and we're subject to the temperature, the surrounding temperature. Um, so for DESI, uh, the plan is instead, or the, what we do instead is the spectrographs um, are put in a nice climate controlled uh, clean room uh, 
Uh, and But then we have to get the light from the top of the telescope down through the telescope. It has moving parts, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a 50 meter run of fiber, 5,000 fibers, that goes down to this clean room. And, and then, so 500 fibers each plug into these spectrographs, there are 10 of them. Um, and the fibers come in in a big stack, like they're lined up in a big stack. And then their light shines onto um, prism, basically, that splits their light into a rainbow. And then that rainbow lands on, a, on like a sensor, a CCD sensor, like a camera, basically. Um, so what you see in the images are 500 like rows of rainbows. <laughs> mm. um, but of course, they're not the, the these sensors themselves are monochrome, like they only they measure, they just measure black and white. Mm -hmm. um, so you see kind of a brighter or fainter line, um, 500 of those spaced together across the chip. Uh, so brighter spots are you know, places in the spectrum that are brighter. So during the afternoon, we use these calibration sources. So like, you, you know, you can shine light of a known wavelength and measure where it appears in, in the images. So you can say, oh, that little bump is, a, is red. Right. <laughs> or is that, you know, uh, 540 nanometers and this little bump is at, at you know, some other uh, wavelength. Um, so yeah, but. The thing that's that's kind of um, amazing looking at the raw data, though, is that all of them look the same, basically. And that's because the sky is pretty bright. <laughs> Even the, the night sky, the darkest times, is um, is actually the thing that we detect most strongly in the images. So it's only by s subtracting out the contribution of the sky that we get to see the stars and galaxies in behind. Uh, it's not an easy way to live. <laughs> <laughs> and once all that information is collected from those thousand or five thousand uh, points, does it then go to you to figure out, or you and your team to to then do all of the computational work to understand it? Yeah, other people on my team, <laughs> on my teams. Um, my work on Desi uh, comes earlier, actually. Okay. Um, I've been involved in. Remember I said you have to choose ahead of time which, which things you want to observe, um, which we do from images. So first you go out and take an image of the sky, um, in our case in like three different filters or three colors, mm -hmm. um, and you measure all the stars and galaxies and measure their brightnesses and colors, um, and choose some set of them to, that are interesting for follow-up. Um, we get to choose about 1% of them. Um, and so when we started DESI, there was no imaging survey that existed that was deep enough to make those measurements, right? We wanted to measure things that were faint enough that they just didn't appear in, um, in the, the existing generation of imaging surveys. Right. So we had to go out and do those imaging surveys. So that's the part that I was kind of most, uh, mostly involved with. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping you can tell us a little bit more about this idea you referred to as splitting up the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum is quite wide and only a small portion of it is visible. And then you also do some splitting up within that visible piece. Can you just tell us a little bit more about that and how different telescopes focus on different parts of this spectrum? Sure. Uh, so I call myself mostly an optical astronomer, uh, which means I work in more or less the visible part of the spectrum, um, and which then also now bleeds into the infrared a little bit because it's, you can use the same technologies to do that, to observe light that we can't quite observe. Um, so different telescopes tend to be optimized for observing different parts of the spectrum. Um, partly from the ground, only, only parts of the spectrum actually make it through our atmosphere. Um, if you go very much bluer than we can see with our eyes, the atmosphere just blocks everything. Hmm. Um, just the air, you know, absorbs all of that light. Um, as you go toward the infrared, uh, it w water is actually one of the um, one of the annoyances. So water vapor <laughs> in the atmosphere also emits at those same frequencies. So. You that don't often hear, you often hear water called an annoyance. It's also yeah. essential for life on Some the planet. Some people enjoy yeah. it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it has its pros and cons. Right. 
uh, as long as it would just be, <laughs> yeah, stay out of the stay way out of your the upper atmosphere, or or just the uh, couple of uh, cubic kilometers around our telescopes, that would be great. <laughs> See if you can do that. Yeah, uh, and then if you go further into the infrared, that is just heat, and then it's really hard to um, observe something faint in the sky when like your telescope and your mirrors are all glowing, mm. <laughs> which is basically what happens in the infrared. Um, and then so there's a big chunk of the infrared that we can't reach, which is why people launch things into space to observe in that, in that frequency range. So J, JWST, for example, um, and a telescope I really love, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer, WISE, also a NASA, NASA mission. Um, and they go to space because basically you can't observe, or it's very, very difficult to observe that from the ground. Mm -hmm. uh, my advisor did a bunch of um, infrared observing as part of his PhD and, you know, spent many, many nights on some of the biggest telescopes in the world and in order to make these measurements basically through, despite the fact that your telescope is glowing at those frequencies. Um, and he said the Spitzer Space Telescope, one of the first infrared missions, um, totally uh, made obsolete all of his observations within its first second of observation. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Like, it's really good to observe when the sky is dark, basically. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, it's not easy, basically, observing during the daytime. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so that, I mean, basically, the, the atmosphere sets what we can do from the ground right. and sets what we can do with telescopes. Um, and then there's another atmospheric window, we call it, in the radio. So I think we'll come back to that later. Mm -hmm. DESI, it's called the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. You've told us a bit about the spectroscopic part. What is the dark energy aspect of this experiment? Right, so <laughs> dark energy. Um, <laughs> big subject? A pretty big subject, yep. One of the, it's one of, dark energy is one of the real mysteries in astrophysics these days, or cosmology these days. Um, so to explain that, we go right back to the beginning, uh, to the Big Bang. The very beginning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so over around 100 years ago, the observation was made by Hubble that uh, if you look at galaxies, you can measure how f whether they're moving towards us or away from us. And Hubble observed that all the galaxies are moving away from us. Uh, and not only that, the ones that are further away are moving away faster. Um, so that tells you basically that the universe is expanding. Mm -hmm. um, and so, which then kind of leads you to the idea that, oh, in the past it must have been smaller. What's the end point of that? Is all of the universe being very in a very small place and there being kind of a big bang that makes it expand out from there? So if you just imagine like, uh, you know, a big, there's a big bang, everything starts expanding away from it, everything else. Uh, and then gravity is trying to pull it back together. Um, you might think there are kind of three possibilities there. So one would be like the big bang gives it a kick, it expands, and then gravity starts pulling it back together. And then is gravity is strong enough to pull everything back together? and everything collapses again, and there's a big crunch. Mm -hmm. uh, option two is there's a big bang, gravity is trying to pull everything back together, and it's just not quite strong enough to pull everything back together, but everything kind of stops, mm -hmm. or kind of dr slowly drifts down to zero speed. So it's expanding, but it's but slowing it's just, down? Kind of yeah, like exactly. Until it and then reaches like an equilibrium. I, maybe it it's there. pretty hard to, <laughs> to hit a perfect balance like right. that. Right. Um, so then the third option is the Big Bang kick is big enough that gravity can't pull it back together. It tries, but as you get further apart, gravity gets weaker. So then it's sort of you hit a constant drift rate where everything's drifting further apart at a constant speed, basically. The mystery of dark energy, which was discovered in the 90s, is that there's a different thing going on. Where it's not only the drifting apart at a constant speed, it's drifting apart and there's an acceleration that's pushing it faster than that. So it's like not only was there the Big Bang, there's something else that's continuing to give it a kick. Mm -hmm. um, so there's something 
that we don't know what it is and things that we don't know what they are in astronomy we call them dark so we've mm -hmm. got dark matter we've got dark energy we don't know what they are uh, and it's just making the size of the universe accelerate like grow larger uh, and speed up in right. its growth um, and it's a basically a mystery of what it is um, there when Einstein first wrote down the equations for general relativity um, there is a term in those equations that Einstein put in to keep the universe stable to keep the universe from collapsing again because um, Einstein wanted the universe to be able to be stable mm -hmm. um, and then with Hubble's um, findings Einstein called that his greatest blunder but then it turns out that that same factor that same uh, constant in the equations if you make it negative it gives you dark energy mm -hmm. <laughs> it explains dark energy or like uh, at least um, appears in the equations uh, it doesn't that doesn't really help us to understand what it you know physically is it's, mm -hmm. is it something that we can ever interact with in any kind of <laughs> uh, in any kind of real way or is it just like a, a, a kind of fact of the way space in the universe works mm -hmm. um, there are lots of ideas about what um, dark energy is or how it could work uh, and with Desi we're basically just trying to go out and make the measurements and those measurements will help to um, to disentangle or to tell the difference between different models of what dark energy might be mm -hmm. so um, the goal of Desi is to measure the size of the universe at different times in the past mm -hmm. so basically we're trying to chart that growth of the size of the universe over time and different models of what dark energy will predict different um, you know shapes of that curve of how fast the universe grows over time so by just going out and making the measurement we we should be able to kind of tell the difference between different models of dark energy and help to rule out some possible explanations when you mention over time, you don't mean you do an observation one week and then the next week and the next week. You mean over like cosmic time, right? You're essentially looking back at where galaxies were billions of years ago versus where they were, I don't know, other billion, another <laughs> yeah. amount of billion years ago. Is that, yes, is that that's right. Yeah, that's fair? exactly right. So and how, can you tell how fast they're moving? Just where, or if you know where they are at one point and another point, then you know the speed of acceleration. It. Um, so like you said, from on human time scales, basically the, the, the extra galactic universe is static. Mm -hmm. um, we can see the stars moving. They don't move very much, but with precision instruments, you can tell that they're moving. Um, but the galaxies more or less are stationary on the skies to, to the precisions that we can measure. Um, so <laughs> distances in cosmology are really complicated. <laughs> Uh, it's hard to just talk about the distances between things when the whole fabric that they're sitting on is growing. So right. d distances in cosmology are complicated. So the two things we can really measure are angles on the sky mm -hmm. and redshifts. Right. So redshifts, lots of people have heard explained before, but basically um, the light from a galaxy if you break it into a rainbow has a certain signature and uh, what we observe is not that signature as we'd expect to see it but that signature shifted and uh, it's sort of like the Doppler effect when you know when you hear that when the train goes from moving towards you from moving away from you the whistle shifts from mm -hmm. higher to lower um, uh, so if you're talking about light lower is redder toward the red like uh we, even if it's <laughs> in the infrared we still just call it to, toward the red or toward the blue like you know right uh, and so what we observe is all the galaxies signatures are shifted toward the red okay. by different amounts so they're red shifted by different amounts uh and that observation from hubble was that things that are galaxies that are more distant are more shifted to the red um, okay, so that's one thing we can actually measure, mm -hmm. redshifts, and that's what DESI's real thing is. The other is angles on the sky, another thing that DESI is very good at doing because we have to <laughs> know where the galaxies are to actually observe them. So 
the thing that lets us tie those two things together and measure the scale of the universe over time is this nice little feature that the universe gave us. <laughs> um, so this again goes back to the Big Bang. <laughs> uh, a little bit after the Big Bang, the universe was this, we kind of call it a hot soup, I guess, of plasma <laughs> and photons. Um, basically everything's so hot that there aren't atoms. Um, there's basically just a big royal of plasma and light and it's all exchanging energy. And uh, it wasn't uniformly spread. There were kind of brighter, like a denser and less dense spots. Um, and that kind of soup kind of allows uh, things like sound waves to propagate. So if you have like a dense spot, you get a ring um, that comes out from it. Mm -hmm. um, and then <laughs> there's a magical point 380,000 years after the Big Bang <laughs> where the universe has grown and cooled enough that um, that plasma can cool down and you can, and you can form atoms. Mm -hmm. And then the photons, it's not a soup anymore. The photons kind of get liberated and are allowed to, to escape. Um, but that little, those rings of over densities are frozen in at that point. Mm -hmm. um, they're sort of imprinted for good. That's right. They're imprinted for good. We can right. see them by observing the light from, <laughs> right. from that time. Uh, that light is now really redshifted into the microwave. Right. And we can see it in all directions and it's called the cosmic microwave background. Uh, it's currently three degrees above absolute zero. So it's at three Kelvin. It's chilly. Uh, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it looks like it's three degrees in all directions. But if you, if you make very, very precise measurements, you see that there are little variations above and below that three degrees, hmm. one part in 10,000, um, that where you can just see the places that were like brighter and colder more dense and less dense at that time. Um, and the parts that were more dense, remember our good, good old friend gravity, um, <laughs> makes, pulls all of that matter together, forms stars and galaxies. Mm -hmm. um, so that little ring uh, uh, that was frozen in at that point has stuck around and means that, so what, we get to observe is that if you look at a single galaxy, um, galaxies aren't spread uniformly on the sky, they cluster. So you're likely to find around a galaxy, you're likely to find other galaxies nearby. Mm -hmm. And then they sort of drop off in density around a galaxy. But then at the radius of that ring, there's a little bump where you're a little bit more likely to find another galaxy. Um, and it's about 1% more likely. <laughs> so it's a, it's a little bit of a subtle signal. <laughs> right. The universe is very kind to give us anything, but it's... <laughs> yeah. may not want to place money on it being there all the time. Well, 1% we've, off. We've, <laughs> by building Jesse, we've placed a lot of money on, <laughs> on it being there. And, um, but the, the beautiful thing about it is that that scale was frozen in. There's kind of nothing you can do to it to change right. what that scale is. So it just basically gets stretched along with the like fabric of the universe or the mm. fabric of space time. Um, so <laughs> what we can do finally with Desi is measure the angular scale of that feature mm -hmm. uh, at different redshifts. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Remember when I said distances in cosmology are complicated? Yes. Yeah. It's a long way to go from. Yeah. Uh, it's not how we think of you know driving distances. <laughs> this is it's a very different uh, sense of distance. Or just using taking out shift. a ruler or something. <laughs> <laughs> well, so this is called a standard ruler because it's a thing that we think we know the physical size of, you know, and then we measure kind of how what angular scale on the sky it fills at different times, right. right? If you think about this in your everyday life, um, you take a ruler and you serve it at arm's length, it fills a certain angle, right? Mm. If right. you move it twice as far away, um, it fills half the angle and so on. 
So the weird thing about cosmology is that that doesn't hold <laughs> because the universe was growing while all of this was going on. That angular diameter distance is called, it's one of many different kinds of distances <laughs> in mm -hmm. astronomy, the angular diameter distance. Um, gets smaller as things get further away, but then it turns over and actually gets bigger again. Things that are very distant are actually bigger on the sky. Hmm. Um, so yeah, with Desi, we get to kind of chart out the, this angular size of a ruler of a known size. And have you personally been one of the people who pokes tiny holes in aluminum and feeds fiber optic cables through them? <laughs> have you been there on the site doing this kind of uh, so it's embarrassing there I'm I'm like a, an expert on some of these telescopes that I've never been to and and the Sloan <laughs> telescope is one of them I've still not managed to get to that site yeah um, it, so in these projects they're large projects they have hundreds of people mm -hmm. involved usually um, dozens of institutions uh, and so we do complicated time tracking to keep track of like who has actually contributed. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a, what am I? I'm an architect in the SDSS project, but I still haven't managed to go to the telescope. Oh, that's a shame. Um, it, it's, it looks nice. <laughs> uh, I have seen the machine shop in at the University of Washington where they drill the holes, but that's yeah. not quite as glamorous. Yeah. I haven't seen the machine in action, the precision drilling machine that they used to to put the holes in just the right spot so that the galaxy yeah. light will fall down them. You were telling us before that a lot of your work was in this pre-analysis stage to decide where the instrument should be pointed. What are you doing now that that pre-analysis, I guess, is finished? Yeah, it's, it's funny being involved in these projects from the early part because our work was mostly done by the time the instrument was at the, on the mountain, mounted on the telescope taking observations. Um, in these projects, because we're trying to measure these really subtle signals where there's like 1% more galaxies at a certain radius than you'd expect, um, it's pretty important to understand not only the ones you observe, but the ones you don't observe. So we go to a lot of effort to track kind of all of the effects, all of the statistical effects that can cause us to not observe um, a galaxy or observe more galaxies on a certain part of the sky than, than the uniform. Um, so for that reason, to make the bookkeeping easier, basically, these projects usually freeze the sample, like we choose the set of galaxies we want to observe at the start of the project, uh, and then hold that fixed, like just proceed with that plan for the next five years in the case of DESI. Um, so yeah, basically all of all of our work had to be done before the main survey started. Um, so one of the things I'm doing is figuring out what we should do with DESI next. Mm -hmm. It was funded for a five-year mission or five-year survey. Uh, but at the end of that time, it's still going to be the best instrument in the world for this work, or at least one of the, <laughs> one of the best instruments in the world for this work. Um, so we're currently kind of trying to devise some plans of uh, what to do with it next. Um, which is a kind of a combination of an interesting science case and a feasible <laughs> uh, set of galaxies to observe. Uh, and part of that might involve going out and doing more imaging mm -hmm. along the same theme. Are you, um, are you confident that the mystery of dark energy can be solved or maybe will be solved through some of these efforts and the ones that will follow? <sighs> that is a... Fascinating question. Um, <laughs> I know it requires some optimism and you don't have all the information, but there's a lot of progress being made, it seems. Yeah, it's one of <laughs> the big mysteries in cosmology, so we're putting in a fair bit of effort toward it. Um, the, th the thing that's... Um, that is a challenge <laughs> is that all of the current observations point to it are consistent with it being kind of the simplest explanation, which is kind of the, that cosmological constant that, that Einstein's equations allow. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, so everything so far is consistent with kind of the most boring explanation, <laughs> which is still like mind boggling and uh, really difficult to understand. 
or like to have a, a real like intuitive sense for. Um, and it, we don't really have an explanation for it. It's just kind of like, there's just a, it's just a fact of how space behaves, mm -hmm. uh, that there's this weird fluid kind of thing that pushes space apart. <laughs> and when you push space apart, you make more space and then there's more of that stuff in it that's pushing it apart more. Right. Um, it's pretty noodle bending. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, yeah, I saw it described sort of like, um, if you had a balloon, just a normal party balloon and you squeezed it, the analog would be the balloon would just keep collapsing even after you it, it, it wouldn't, right, it wouldn't resume right. its original shape. But in this case, no matter what you do to the universe, it seems to be accelerating and getting bigger. Yeah, I guess with Desi, it's, it's possible for us to make this next generation of measurements of like how big the universe is over time. So we, <laughs> that's for some of us, that's good enough. The fact that it's there and we can do it. Uh, and mm -hmm. those measurements then kind of push theorists toward coming up for, with different explanations or refining their explanations. Um, a lot of cosmology ends up being this kind of uh, back and forth between theory and observation mm -hmm. and computation and like uh, simulation. Um, so basically this is just our next step on the observational side is to make the measurements and see what the theorists can do with it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned observational astronomy being sort of your, more of your bread and butter than radio astronomy, but you're also involved in radio astronomy. And until you told us this a couple of days ago when we were chatting, I never really made the distinction in my head that there's two different or at least two different. Could you tell us sort of the difference and then maybe tell us how you work in radio astronomy as well? Yeah, it's funny. Astronomy is not that big of a scientific field, but we're still split into these silos. <laughs> um, and part of it is just basically technologies. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the trick with observational astronomy is focusing the light, or at least that's one of the <laughs> focusing and capturing the light. Um, and the tools you need to do that depend on the kind of light you're kind of trying to gather. So for optical astronomy, the wavelengths are really short. Uh, so if you want to make a mirror that focuses that light, it has to be ground really precisely. Um, it takes years to make an astronomical mirror. And when new projects get funded, that's often the first thing they do is right. book a spot in the mirror lab to get their, their lab, their mirror built and polished because right. that will take as long as the rest of the project put together. Because even if there's a, a tiny little defect in the mirror, it could ruin everything, right? Um, as long as the whole thing is basically the right shape, you can get away with small parts okay. of it being, uh, being imperfect. But if the whole thing is the wrong shape, <laughs> then you're just in a world of hurt. <laughs> yeah. uh, so when Hubble was originally launched, yeah. it had this issue. And that just means that you want all of the light that comes from a distant point to bounce off your mirror and hit the sensor at the same place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if your mirror is the wrong shape, that doesn't happen. Yeah. Uh, and you, if your mirror is too rough, then that also doesn't happen because uh, the waves coming, hitting different parts of the mirror uh, instead of adding together, interfere with each other and right. subtract. So, uh, so in optical astronomy, the mirrors have to be just beautiful. Um, in radio astronomy, the wavelengths are really long. So in CHIME, this experiment that I'm involved with, uh, the radio waves are like uh, 40 centimeters long. Hmm. So if you want to make something that looks like smooth, to a radio wave that's 40 centimeters long, it doesn't have to be very smooth. You know, <laughs> right. it has to be like within millimeters kind of smooth. Right. Uh, so radio telescopes, the mirrors or reflectors tend to be really cheap compared to everything else. Um, in Chime, they're made out of a kind of metal mesh. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the challenge is uh, collecting that light and processing it. So um, radio astronomy is often kind of thought of as chicken wire and supercomputers. <laughs> I love it. it. I do too. Yeah. Uh, so I love how you say that radio astronomy is basically chicken wire and supercomputers. What really is the role of the chicken wire? Uh, the chicken wire is the mirror. 
or the equivalent of the mirror. I'm kind of by training an optical astronomer, so it's really bizarre to be working in radio astronomy where the light acts so differently than what we're used to. Um, but as far as a radio wave is concerned, like a, um, a per parabolic shaped mesh of wire looks like a mirror and hmm. it can focus it. Um, so it you know, bounces right off the chicken wire. <laughs> and if your chicken wire is shaped in just the right way, uh, it, the, it can focus it onto a place, uh, like onto, in the case of chime, onto the antennas. So um, you know, the, the half pipe shape is a parabola, so it focuses all of the light coming from one point on the sky to, um, to a point onto, onto the antenna. You, you mentioned chime. We should explain it a little bit. It's, it's not like any telescope I've seen before. And when I first saw it, I, might, I don't know if I would have guessed telescope. I might have guessed skateboard park. So can you tell us what chime <laughs> yeah. is and why, it, why it's like the way it is? Yeah, chime is wonderful. <laughs> uh, chime is the Canadian hydrogen intensity, Canadian hydrogen intensity mapping experiment. Got it. Good, got it. <laughs> Uh, you can see why we you just use the acronym. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's a radio telescope in the at the Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory near Penticton, British Columbia. Uh, and it is so it's a really unusual telescope design. It doesn't focus light in two dimensions. It only focuses light in one dimension. So it's made out of these parabola shaped like half pipe shaped tubes. Um, and so it focuses light in the direction across the tube, um, but not the direction along the tube. So if you have light coming from a distant galaxy, say, it hits the reflector and it's focused onto a line mm -hmm. along the middle of that, of the half pipe. Okay. Uh, and then Chime has a bunch of antennas along that line that gather all the light. And, and then it goes into our handy supercomputer. <laughs> and Behind the chicken wire? <laughs> <laughs> that's a, <laughs> that's a different, part that's a different challenge. Yeah. So. <laughs> we'll get to that. Yep. Um, and so the cool thing about that is that uh, you can focus in that other dimension uh, after the fact in the supercomputer. So, um, mm. so if you think about, say, um, a star that's to the north of the telescope, it will hit the northern part of the half pipe sooner than the southern part, right? So if you, and all those waves will bounce up to the antennas along that line. And if you, in the supercomputer, then take um, the northernmost telescope, uh, sorry, the northernmost antenna, and then take that value, the antenna just to the south of it, and delay it a little bit, then, and add them together, and take the one south, just to the south of that, and delay it a little bit more. You can add together the waves that hit the telescope at different times, mm. and that is basically like, acts as though you tilted the telescope by that amount so that they would hit at the same time. Right. Right? Because the telescope is, itself it doesn't it doesn't have moving parts, right? Yeah, the telescope is it. is huge. Yeah. It's twenty meters wide and uh, sorry, each half pipe is twenty meters wide. There are four of them and it's hundred meters long. Wow. And it's like heavy and huge. Uh, yeah, so it has no moving parts. It doesn't we can't steer it in any direction. Um, it basically just sees the um, uh, a strip of the sky and then the earth conveniently rotates so we get to see basically half of the sky or two-thirds of the sky every day that's handy it nice, is pretty nice handy. of the earth to do that it, for you it's pretty kind yeah <laughs> um yes but the cool thing then is that you know we can by more or less delaying the signal from the different antennas and adding them together we can tr it acts like a telescope is pointed in a certain direction um but then if you just delay it by a different amount, you can point it in another direction. <laughs> right. Uh, and it's all done by software. <clears throat> yeah, that's right. It's all done in software. And you can do it all at this. You can point it in all of those directions at the same time. Oh, that's cool. And then with the four half pipes, 
you can combine those in different ways and uh, and kind of point it in software in the other in the east west direction as well. Mm -hmm. And this is not dark energy search. This is a different or is it related? <laughs> it is related. Uh, so the Chime telescope was built for doing this thing called hydrogen intensity mapping, mm -hmm. uh, the HIM part of Chime. <laughs> um, and the idea there is that um, as you go further away or farther back in cosmic time or to higher redshift, uh, it gets harder and harder to observe galaxies because they're just faint, mm -hmm. right? So doing this trick of that we do in DESI of trying to measure galaxies and then measure the slightly more likely to observe one at that, that magical distance away, mm -hmm. that trick just gets really hard because the galaxies are faint. Mm -hmm. um, and the thing that's kind of uh, frustrating about it is that you're going to measure a bunch of them, but you know that they cluster and like you have to measure a whole bunch of them uh, to kind of map out this cosmic web. And so the idea with hydrogen intensity mapping is, let's not measure individual galaxies, let's just measure all of the hydrogen collectively. And that hydrogen is around all the galaxies and along the cosmic web and filaments and everything. So don't try to measure individual galaxies, just measure the kind of the uh, broad sweep of hydrogen mm -hmm. uh, and use that to understand this, this growth of the universe over time. Um, so Chime was built to do that experiment. Uh, and they're trying to map um, a region or a range of redshifts that slightly overlap DESI, but go further than we can really go with galaxies. Mm -hmm. um, so it's looking back closer toward the Big Bang uh, with this totally different technique of mapping the hydrogen, which emits in the radio and then mm -hmm. gets stretched out. Um, so I'm not actually involved in that side of it, the cosmology side, the hydrogen intensity mapping side. And this is another kind of cool thing about radio telescopes. Um, while Chime was being kind of proposed and built and designed, um, people realized that it would also be really well suited to uncovering another astrophysical mystery, <laughs> uh, the mystery of fast radio bursts. Um, so fast radio bursts um, were first discovered in 2007. <laughs> right off the top of your head. Right. <laughs> uh, but that's, that's recent. That's um, not that long ago. In yep, exactly. It's, um, and they were discovered in archival observations. And, or rather, the first one was discovered in archival observations. Uh, and what fast radio bursts are, or what we observe, are these really brief, they're like a millisecond long, <laughs> burst of radio light. Um, and that, that's the, <laughs> the quick, they're, <laughs> they're fast, they're in the radio, they're bursts. Oh, it's a good um, name for them. Yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> the, uh, so in the time between the first one discovered in 2007 and when Chime was being constructed, a few more had been discovered. So they were getting to be not, not a one-off event, but something that kind of existed in the universe right. <laughs> that we could possibly go out and try to measure a bunch of. And so the fact that Chime can see a huge chunk of the sky at once and observes the whole sky once a day, thanks to the Earth rotating, makes it a really good instrument for searching for, you know, searching over the whole sky for something that you don't know where it's going to come from. So funding was secured to build an addition to the Chimes telescope, uh, which was just a fast radio burst search part of Chime. So it's called Chime FRB. Mm -hmm. um, and so remember how I said in software, you can focus the telescope in different, at different directions. Um, basically, we get, <laughs> we ask that supercomputer to do some different computations uh, and send the data to um, kind of and the Chime FRB system, which is itself another little supercomputer mm -hmm. um, that does this real-time search for fast radio bursts, so all over the sky. 
when you say a real time search all over the sky, is this where the big data comes in? Lots and lots of data? Yeah, that's right. So the chime correlator, that's the, <laughs> the well, one of the supercomputers involved in this whole thing, um, focuses the light in a thousand spots in the sky for us and breaks it into 16,000 frequency channels. So, you know, when you're tuning the radio and you mm -hmm. can t t choose different FM stations, um, we have 16,000 stations to choose from. Wow. <laughs> um, some of them are just full of uh, people's cell phone LTE traffic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thankfully, we can just ignore those ones. Mm -hmm. um, just everyone has a radio station they don't like, right? <laughs> yeah. Just tune, tune them uh, down. Yep, just skip those ones. Yeah. But how many of them are taken up by the cell phone? Oh, m more and more. Um, it's, it's a noisy world with all the it. It is a noisy traffic. world. Yeah, that's right. Um, we lose... 10 or 20 percent it's it's pretty bad um, but it's kind of a consistent range for the most part um, the the 4g LTE bands are just lost to us entirely <laughs> um, and then there's some other ones that come on and off periodically that uh, we have to filter out mm -hmm. um, so anyway the, the correlator sends us a thousand places on the sky um, 16,000 channels and the brightness in each channel one time per millisecond <laughs> okay so that's a thousand times a thousand times sixteen thousand per second yeah um and that is basically just too fast for us it's too much data for us to write to disk um so those signals get sent to this set of uh, 128 computers that are searching through the data in real time looking for uh, the signature of a fast radio burst. Um, <clears throat> so I said that they're a burst, but the um, they're a burst at their origin, but then they have to travel through a bunch of space to get to us. Mm -hmm. And space isn't quite empty, so uh, when those radio waves interact with electrons, um, what happens is the high frequencies arrive first and the lower frequencies arrive later. Uh, it's called a dispersion. So what we observe is that uh, there's kind of a sweep down from high frequency to low frequency uh, that can be tens of seconds long or like a minute long. Hmm. Um, so this real-time search has to look through, you know, has to store like a, a minute of data and look for kind of all the possible different sweeps down mm -hmm. um, depending on how much how many electrons were between us and the source that determines how the shape of that sweep so it's searching for all these different sweeps corresponding to kind of different distances of the fast radio burst being away from us right um, for these thousand places on the sky <laughs> simultaneously and then basically if we find something that looks interesting uh, we write down just the data around that place on the sky and that little chunk of time for later analysis. Right. So in those cases, you'll save everything that's coming in, but most of the time you'll just get rid of most of the data. Yeah, that's right. So we'll save everything that comes to the chime fast radio burst side. Mm -hmm. That's been reduced a lot already from the raw data, from the raw data rate mm -hmm. collected by... Um, by the first com first supercomputer in the chain, um, for things that are really bright, we'll also ask that one. It also saves a little chunk of past data, and we can ask it to also save uh, a little chunk of data around the sweep. Um, that one collects 800 gigabytes of data per second, so we only ask it for a tenth of a tenth of a second around where we where the sweep was. Wow. Sorry, how much per how little time? <laughs> I'm trying to wrap my head around just yeah, eight, like in the sense of data the way we understand it. This is yeah, that's right. Enormous, so eight hundred right? gigabytes a second. So if you go out and buy the biggest um, hard drive you can these days, say twelve terabytes, that fills up in like fifteen seconds. <laughs> and this is the data 
to chime or just chime FRB? That's the data to chime. Okay. Yeah. So that's um, reading all of the voltages from all of the antennas along the half pipe of chime that then, you know, that then can get added together in different ways to point the telescope in different directions on the sky. Hey, you you told us the other day when we were chatting that just the sheer volume of data is equivalent to, or it's a portion of the entire data exchange on our cell phone networks in it, North America. So, yeah, I looked it up. It, it's a moving target, but if you look at um, the international data transfers on the internet, um, inside the Chime supercomputer, it's doing 1% of that. <laughs> so 1% like of the world <laughs> yeah. internet traffic is being exchanged within that Chime correlator to do those additions of like the right. pointing the telescope at different points on the sky. And it's doing that over and over again? Just con continuously. It's amazing. Yeah. yeah. During the day, Chime doesn't, <laughs> radio telescopes <laughs> don't care. Yeah. We can see the sun, but it's not the brightest thing in the sky. Um, rain is a little bit of a downer. <laughs> And you, you mentioned airplanes uh, are a bit of a pain as well. Airplanes are terrible. Um, <laughs> they're, um, it's not so much the signals that the airplanes themselves are emitting, but they're like, a, as far as the radio waves are concerned, they're a mirror in the sky. Oh. Um, so we can like see over the horizon down to the noisy <laughs> cities and uh, cell phones and other things around. Um, so when... The Chime telescope's not that far from the Kelowna airport, so we, we see many, many telescope, uh, many, many airplanes uh, and have to filter them out. Yeah, that's oh. amazing, the, the amount of things you have to contend with. The Milky Way's in our way, it's water's in our way, it's all these things we take world for granted. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and where do you actually process this data? So for Chime, it's all on site, almost all on site, just because the data rates are too big to move anything off, you know, mm -hmm. we, it would be way too much traffic to try to compute, like to move it somewhere else and compute there. So um, all the computing is done on site, basically. Uh, and, and when you say on site, it, I, it, my first thought maybe would be this huge bank of computers in a sophisticated room with monitors, but th there's shipping, steel shipping containers on site, right? Yep, steel, and, steel shipping containers, good old 40 fit shipping cans or sea cans are, um, kind of the building of choice to stick these things in. Uh, they're, you know, cheap enough to get and uh, robust. Um, so yeah, one of the challenges is that uh, a, a big computer cluster is itself really noisy in the radio. It emits a lot of, it just makes a lot of electrical noise. Um, so inside of the steel shipping container, we also have to build like a shielded room that the computers can go in so that they don't make a bunch of noise that right. we then hear with the telescope. Um, <laughs> so there's natural challenges, <laughs> challenges that we create ourselves with our technology that we have to get around. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the kind of fun thing is that, you know, the, because the radio waves are pretty long, if you drill a small hole in the shipping container, the radio waves can't get through it. So the shipping containers have all of these, you know, basically small holes where all of the cables and power and cooling and everything come into the shipping container and into the supercomputers inside. I'm wondering if you can also speak maybe a little bit more broadly to a challenge that you might face when collecting all of this data in an experiment and then having to figure out how to store it. And maybe we can play the question from Domenica. My name is Domenica. I'm a student at the Archaeotic University and the PSI Start Program. I was wondering if is it a fundamental issue, the fact that computations depend on the discrete, whereas the physical laws depend on the continuum? Yeah, that's a deep question. Um, the physical world is continuous as far as we observe. Quantum <laughs> theorists might argue about that. But um, <laughs> at our scales, it's continuous. But we have to do all this. Our current computing is all discrete, right? Um, so in Chime, the antennas are, are really measuring this continuous signal um, and from the antennas. And, but those come through cables into the first supercomputer in Chime. And basically, the first thing we do is turn them into digital signals. Um, and uh, so there's a resolution problem there, basically, where we um, 
you have to choose how many bits to use to represent it. Um, and so if you look at your computer display, um, you might think that, it, you know, it sort of looks like it can make all of the colors that you can observe, right? But modern computer displays use eight bits <laughs> for each of red, green, and blue. So they can make 256 different levels of red, green, and blue. And that's enough that we kind of can't distinguish between them. Mm. Um, so as far as like, you know, we can observe with our eyes or our brains, um, that's fine enough that a discrete set of levels um, looks continuous to us. Mm. Uh, and it's kind of, it's a little bit similar in the radio. So it turns out that partly because, well, the world is so noisy <laughs> and, uh, and in radio, you have to add together a lot of individual samples before you actually measure something significant. Um, it turns out that it's okay to do that discretization or, or conversion from analog to digital. In Chime, actually, they only use four bits. So there's only 16 levels of the signal. And that's still enough to kind of recover the continuous phenomena that are observed. So Chime has been extremely successful in this FRB mission. The fast radio bursts, there were a relatively new phenomenon, and then there was only a few detected. And then with chicken wire and supercomputers and ingenuity, Chime ramped up the game, so to speak. Can you tell us you know, what it's discovered and, and what we're learning about the fast radio bursts? Sure. So when Chime came online, there were about 50 fast radio bursts known. And... Uh, Intriguingly, one of them was seen to repeat. So there's not only just one boom, but then you know the same one was emitting multiple bursts, hmm. uh, which really threw the theorists for a loop because some of their explanations required the thing to be destroyed to make a right. burst of energy. The challenge is that fast radio bursts, um, that we've now discovered that they're far away, so which means that they're intrinsically really bright. So it's hard for theorists to come up with ways of kind of generating that much radio energy. Right. And if you don't get to destroy the thing in the process, then it's, <laughs> that puts it even more limits on what you can, what you can contrive, what you can mm -hmm. think of uh, ways of explaining what, what they can possibly be. Um, right. So when Chime came online, about 50 were known. And the fun thing is there was uh, a catalog of known fast radio bursts. And there was also a catalog of theories of what they could be, like possible explanations of what could produce a fast radio burst. Mm -hmm. And there were more theories than there were fast radio bursts. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then Chime in the first two months, while we were still kind of putting the thing together, um, still the chicken wire was in place, but the supercomputers were still being <laughs> built, uh, <laughs> discovered 13 new ones and one new repeating one. Um, wow. And then after the first year of observations, our first catalog paper um, has 492 uh, sources, including 18 repeaters. Wow. Uh, so basically just blew the lid off the, the fast radio burst gain. But I think the, a lot of the current feelings are that the repeaters and the one-off bursts are different populations. So now the theorists can still destroy the regular fast radio bursts, but then they still have to <laughs> explain where the repeating ones come from through some other mechanism. Mm. Uh, you've mentioned a term that I just love uh, in our previous chat, sad trombone. That actually has a meaning in this research. What is a sad trombone in the, a chime <laughs> This is FRB? one of those, like, uh, <laughs> when the term was coined, you knew it would stick. Um, <laughs> so the repeating fast radio bursts tend to have this structure. They're not just a single burst. Um, they kind of have a burst, and then a, maybe a few milliseconds later, a bur like uh, a repeat at a s lower frequency, and then uh, often in three. Like so, they'll sort of have a initial burst lower and lower. So it's like, whop whop whop. <laughs> sad so, trombone. Sad trombone. But it's it's only re these repeating FRBs that do this. They're the. That's and one of the things that the the Chime um, data really contributed to this is kind of understanding the diversity of the fast radio bursts. Like some of them 
some of the non-repeating ones um, cover the whole band. Like we see them uh, being bright all across the frequencies that we measure. Some of them are just bright in the top. Some of them are just bright in the bottom. Some in the middle even. Um, there, some are indeed really, sh really brief, and some are scattered, um, which you get through kind of traversing different kinds of material between us and the source. Mm -hmm. um, so, it part of the you know beauty of doing this large scale search, um, you know, observing the whole sky all the time, or like observing a thousand places on the sky all the time, and observing the whole or the northern half of the sky mm. every day is that we get to build up statistics about what they are and um, collect it in a kind of uniform way so mm. it's you, um, so that it's much easier to try to understand what the real population is before you before whatever effects cause you to observe some or like be unable to observe some or others. Yeah, so it looks like many of the repeaters have the sad trombone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so now sometimes if we see a new burst in chime and it has a sad trombone structure, we'll say, oh, maybe that one's going to come back again. Mm -hmm. And are, are there, is there a prevailing theory or theories about what these things actually, what's causing these distant bursts? <laughs> or do you need to do your cataloging and, and, and tracking them first to, to even come up with an explanation of what they could be? One thing is just that if they're fast, right? So they're a millisecond long. So it's really hard to generate something a millisecond long from some astrophysical thing that's bigger than a light millisecond in size. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, just because, you know, you have to emit it all at the same time from all over the source. Uh, so, you know, you can't really generate something that's that short from something that's like the size of the sun. Right. Because um, it just won't all arrive at the same time. So right. it won't be a millisecond long burst. Um, so that pushes you toward things that are small, and one of the like families of things that could be are neutron stars. Um, so if you start with a star that's, I forget the numbers exactly, 8 to 20-ish times heavier than the sun, mm -hmm. um, it goes through its life of burning hydrogen, and then burning some other things toward the end of its uh, desperate life, trying to stay a star, mm -hmm. um, and eventually runs out of fuel and collapses uh, to a neutron star. And um, neutron star material is really bizarre because um, you take all of, like, say, something most of the size, like, bigger than the mass of the sun, and squeeze it down to 10 kilometers in size. Um, all of, there aren't atoms anymore, all of, everything's been squeezed so far together that it's just like a big ball of neutrons. Um, and it, so it's really bizarre. Uh, one teaspoon of neutron star material weighs billions of tons. <laughs> like, it's just mind boggling. Right. Um, it really does make the mind real. It's like, it's a number imagine. that you just can't really end, like comprehend. Um, so they're they're pretty weird, <laughs> mm -hmm. and but the the other th other interesting things are that like when you when this process happens, you know, um, if the star was spinning initially, it can't really get rid of that spin; it keeps spinning. Um, but now instead of you know a very stately slow rotation of something the size of a sun, you're you know if you if you can picture a figure skater spinning and then pulling in their arms and spinning faster and faster mm -hmm. and faster, mm -hmm. imagine that just continuing on to go uh, instead of spinning, you know, once a week or once a day or something. Some of the neutron stars that are observed will spin like a thousand times a second or more. Um, so they're the like incredibly heavy things that can be spinning really fast. And similarly, their magnetic fields they often keep. So then you have something with a magnetic field that's spinning really fast. Um, and that, uh, if you're a theorist, that's good ingredients to make something that can emit radio waves. Mm -hmm. um, so these pulsars are known, um, like uh, neutron stars that are observed to emit periodic pulses mm -hmm. of radio waves. Um, 
they were they were first discovered in 1967 by Jocelyn Bell Burnell, right? Um, who is amazing. Mm -hmm. So some of the th theories for fast what fast radio bursts could be are kind of exotic types of neutron stars of some kind. Um, the problem is that the fast radio bursts are like millions of times brighter than neutron stars that we know in the Milky Way. Um, so it's, and you can't just make them bigger because if you make them too big, they collapse to black holes. So right. <laughs> you can't just make a bigger neutron star. Um, it has to be, so, there has to be kind of something else going on. Um, so there was another, we got another kind of clue or a, a hint maybe um, in 2021, there was a fast radio burst from, um, from a neutron star in our own galaxy, uh, a special kind called the magnetars. They're kind of neutron stars with really extreme magnetic fields. Um, and Chime observed that, like we caught that one, we saw it go streaming by and we said, ooh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and it kind of has an energy that's in between. So uh, it's a few hundred times brighter, I think, than usual neutron, than usual pul pulsars. So it's kind of filling in a bit of that, right. that million factor of a million you need to get to fast radio bursts. So maybe they're an extreme kind of, this extreme kind of magnetar. Yeah. So uh, it, um, there are kind of hints and clues, but uh, it's still a pretty big mystery. Um, and we keep kind of finding odd things. Um, so one, just another thing discovered last year or the year before by a graduate student in the Chime group was um, that one of the repeaters uh, not only repeats, a, um, but it repeats <laughs> on a clock. Uh, she found that it was, if she took all of the pulses, she was looking at all when we had observed the fast radio bursts, and she said, it looks like it's like repeating every 16 days. <laughs> uh, and it's not like, you know, it's, um, so she took the signal and like folded it and found that um, all of the bursts come within a five day period around that 16 days. So it's like, you know, on for five days and then off for 11 days, on for five days, off for 11. And most of them appear within like a one day window around the peak. So it's mm. like mostly on and on day one and then it's kind of on a little bit for the next four days and then off for 11 days. Um, so that adds <laughs> another, another. another element to the mystery and we don't know if they if all of the repeaters do this but maybe some of them we haven't they have maybe they have different periods and we haven't observed most of them for long enough to be able to notice that yet. right um so then that maybe makes you think there's um that maybe there's like a neutron star and something else in a binary like orbiting each other and then when you have that you can get it so that the neutron star is spinning and it's sort of like a lighthouse that's that's wobble or like a top that's wobbling. Right. And when you're looking straight down on the top, it you can see a burst from it. Um, so maybe it, that that's what's doing it, and that you know it wobbles once every 16 days, and it's when it's pointed like more at us that we see the bursts. Um, so they're kind of some, so now, you know, you make the picture more and more complicated. Like it has yeah. to be a really extreme magnetar in a binary with something else yeah. that's giving it this wobble. Um, so <laughs> it's mystery a mystery remains. Yeah. Yep. The mysteries remain. Well, that's, that's the exciting part. There's lots for you to do. <laughs> it's really, uh, it's the first time I've been involved in a project like this, that's, that's kind of broken open a new part of observing space and is really just like finding all kinds of cool things there. Um, and it's really, so it's been really fast paced and really fun. And, um, part of the way Canadian projects work, there are a lot of graduate students involved. So a lot of the people making these discoveries are, are, you know, people who are working on their PhDs or master's degrees. And they're, you know, they're just at the forefront of this field. So it's you know, really exciting. It's really neat to see all the things they're discovering. On the topic of being at the forefront, you have told us also that lots of 
the work here relies on being at the forefront of computational technology. And we had a question sent in on the topic of GPUs. This was sent in from Craig in the IT and AV department here at Perimeter. Hi, Dustin. I heard it mentioned here recently at Perimeter this specific piece of hardware known as an Einstein equation code GPU, which is the graphics processor from a video card reprogrammed to run the Einstein equation code for simulations. I wonder if you could explain in a little more detail what an Einstein equation code GPU is, how one is programmed to run the Einstein equation code, and how successful it has actually been in simulations. OK, that's a good question. I'm going to first talk a little bit about Chime, I guess. Um, I said that you know it's chicken wire and supercomputers. So uh, multiple supercomputers in this case. Um, so in Chime, the first supercomputer it comes into are these custom-built um, you know, computer boards that, uh, that use FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays, and they're these kind of really low level, it's sort of like a computer chip where you get to choose where the wires go. Um, so they're really difficult to program, but really fast at what they do. Right? So they're, you know, you program them once and they do a single task very fast. Um, and, uh, you know, it can sort of, the task that first computer has to do is simple enough that this is achievable. And then it sends all the data to the second supercomputer, the Chime Correlator, uh, that has to do more complicated tasks. And so you can't do that in these really difficult to program FPGAs. But it turns out that um, you can use these GPUs, graphics processing units, um, to do the computations. Um, and GPUs are harder to program than, than garden variety CPUs, um, but they're way more flexible than like FPGAs. So, um, so Chime, the Chime correlator has to use these GPUs basically to get the amount of computation out that we have, that it has to do. Uh, and it uses um, 1,024 of what were at the time very cutting edge GPUs. Uh, I love the whole thing. I love all of the technology involved in it. Um, they're water cooled, and the water kind of comes in and goes over each GPU in turn. Uh, and we have sensors on them, and you can kind of see the water heating up <laughs> as it goes through <laughs> each GPU and cools it. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, basically, these GPUs, although they were originally built for graphics for video games, hmm. um, you know, gra if you think about it, graphics for video games, a lot of the tasks are like, running something that's going to produce a, a color, say, for each pixel on your screen. And you know, if you have a screen that's like 2,000 by 2,000 pixels, I'm making that number up, then you have 4 million computations to do. And, um, and, but you're doing kind of the same thing for each one. Right? Mm -hmm. So GPUs are kind of specialized for doing um, relatively simple tasks, but in massively parallel. Uh, and that just turns out to be a really good match to some of the tasks that we have to do because in radio, you know, for the radio astronomy um, computations, it's the same task done a lot of times in parallel. So say a, a thousand places on the sky or 16,000 frequencies, that computation is the same for each one. So it's basically, you know, kind of a fairly simple process that you just have to repeat a bunch of times. So that really works well for GPUs. Um, and so their GPUs are really widely used for also now a bunch of machine learning or AI um, applications because a lot of those problems can also be phrased as hmm. uh, you know, doing a fairly simple operation a lot of times in parallel. Um, and so they're, they're kind of just a, a way of accessing a lot of computing power uh, at the expense that you have, they're harder to program, so you have to put more effort into describing the problem you want to solve, and especially how to solve it in massive parallel. Um, so uh, this um, Einstein equations, <laughs> um, this was actually work done 
by people including my um, my boss and office mate uh, Eric Schnetter at Perimeter, um, and they do work. They work on computer programs that solve the Einstein's general relativity equations. So you might have heard it said that uh, in general relativity, um, matter tells space how to bend, <laughs> and space tells matter how to move. <laughs> Um, so, you know, when there's mass, it changes the shape of space and then mass moves along straight lines in bendy space. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're a mathematician, that sounds like differential equations. It's, you know, they're sort of two things and they're affecting each other. Um, so, uh, those are equations that you can solve. You know, if you put a bunch of mass down, you can compute how the space will be bent, and then you can compute how the mass will move around in that bendy space. Mm -hmm. um, so it's possible to, you know, understand. Um, and you only need this when you're dealing with really extreme <laughs> kinds of situations. So black holes often come up, um, neutron stars probably. Mm -hmm. uh, but in order to understand situations like that, basically you have to, you can either try to understand really simple situations with math on, on a blackboard, or you can do computer simulations of them. And those computer simulations involve doing a lot of the same computation in parallel. Uh, so they lend themselves to GPUs. Um, so Eric's group have made implementations of solving the Einstein equations on GPUs. Uh, so it's really neat, you know, it's a really, um, uh, so I guess <laughs> that's the, the sense in which there's a, you know, a graphics card that can solve the Einstein equations. Yeah. That's fascinating. I, I, I knew that uh, that question was coming up. I was looking forward to your answer because that's an area that I know very little about and now I know something as opposed to nothing, thanks to you. <laughs> Uh, we actually have another, we have two more uh, questions from students. Um, let's hear. Hi, Dustin. I'm Summer from Waterloo. If you could travel anywhere in the universe to see something with your own eyes, what would it be? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> I don't think I'd want to put my own eyes close enough to a fast radio first <laughs> to see it. Let's say you're safe. You're in a safe <laughs> space vehicle somehow. <laughs> Okay, good. With enough shielding, <laughs> uh, I'd love to see a fast radio burst because what on earth are they? Um, and, you know, like I said, you have to, the theorists really have, are working hard to contrive scenarios that can, can build a, can make a fast radio burst. So there's going to be all sorts of wild stuff going on around uh, something that can make a fast radio burst is my guess or my hope at least. Um, I mean, Black holes, of course, are like the accretion disk and like the, because, you know, we don't see bendy space in our everyday lives. So right. there was a recent news article of looking at light that comes out the back, like behind you, behind uh, a black hole and is bent all the way around mm -hmm. or sometimes bends around and makes multiple laps before it gets out and sees you. So like, you know, we're not we don't really experience the fact that space is bendy, but mm -hmm. so it would be pretty cool to see bendy space around a black hole. I agree. <laughs> uh, and we have a second question that may follow from the first. Hi, Dustin. I'm Justina from Waterloo. I was wondering, what's the most fascinating thing to you about the universe? Well, that's going right to the core of it. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> well, one of, so, one of the really bizarre things is, is that the universe seems to be like kind of comprehensible with math. Like it's so, um, it's kind of bizarre that you can, in cosmology, you can write down like, um, you know, a set of equations with like five or six parameters that kind of explain on, at the large scales, like how the universe grows over time. Like that to me is just bizarre. It's like, the weirdest thing is that it's, it seems to be like comprehensible or like within the realm of possibility that we could understand things about the universe with like basically math and, and that we can like 
understand things about the universe by writing computer code mm -hmm. <laughs> and that somehow people will pay me to do this for a job like it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i suppose you uh you would be uh, that job posting that your friends joked to you you had to go for it perimeter it wouldn't have existed had the universe not been somewhat comprehensible and that there would be mysteries for you to dive into <laughs> yeah well some people say that like we are like the universe's way of understanding itself mm -hmm. you mentioned that one of the downsides of your job is you don't always get to go to the telescopes that are doing the work and you haven't been to chime even though it's really close to where you grew up right uh, yeah it's just it's just one mountain range away from where I grew up in Christina. <laughs> well, the Lake, long British way Columbia. is over the mountain. But, um, so yeah, you're from British Columbia originally, and uh, and you still haven't made it to the telescope. I, it's one mountain range across I the I know, I still have, my, my mom is quite upset. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, they're just my work somehow hasn't contrived to manage to f make me go out there. Um, there are, we have staff members on site and team members on site. So, um, but for the the goal is for the whole system to be remotely operate operable. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, a, from time to time we have to get somebody to go and unplug something by hand or turn it off, for, but from for most of it we have all it's all set up for remote observation. Um, partly because whenever people are on site, they just they tend to, um, not the staff, the staff are very good, but uh, whenever we have visitors, contractors, whatever, they never turn their cell phones off. <laughs> and that interferes with That's it. the loudest thing in the sky. Yeah. <laughs> it's louder than anything in the sky. So yeah, um, yeah uh, the fewer people on the site, the better actually for the most right. part. Um, during the building of Chime, there was a, a huge amount of physical effort put in as far as like pulling cables, because you know, there's, um, 2,000 <laughs> cables that come from the half pipes into the first supercomputer and then hundreds of fiber optic lines that come from that one to the next computer and so on. So there's, there was a huge amount of effort, but I thankfully came on the project a little bit after that <laughs> was all in place. Yeah. Um, but it, 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 it is still a huge treat to go to the telescopes. Um, I spent a lot of time at the DESI site and, and at its twin telescope in Chile and it's just beautiful up there. Uh, it's a real treat to to have the privilege to observe from those places. Well, you'll have to get to Chime and then visit your mother or <laughs> vice versa. <laughs> um, your, your enthusiasm for this stuff, especially the real mysterious stuff is, uh, is just infectious and you know, I've learned so much and my mind is reeling at some of the, the data and the sizes and the scale. So thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. Thank you, it's my pleasure.